Good evening, everyone, to our esteemed panelists, students, parents, and staff. I'm extremely delighted to welcome the speakers for evening, Dr. Arvinder Singh and Dr. Badej. Dr. Arvinder is a psychologist and psychotherapist. She's currently the founder director of Ashoka Center for Wellbeing at Ashoka University, and also she's consultant to United Nations. As a mental health practitioner who has been educated and trained in India and abroad, her mission is to bring the best mental health practices to India and promoting a narrative of well-being. Her work, which spans over 20 years, ranges from private practice as a psychotherapist to corporate training, from teaching and leadership coaching to creating awareness about mental health issues. She works on building healing spaces through listening and sharing stories. She's also the founder of an initiative called Listening Circles and Healing Spaces that built on this aspect of her work. An important part of her professional journey has been her work with the traumatized populations in politically sensitive zones in India and abroad, to mention Gujarat, Kashmir, and Northeastern states, besides Afghan refugees and people affected by disasters such as earthquakes in India, Pakistan, and Nepal, where she actively led the mission Psychosocial Support. Her work has been recommended, recognized and supported by UNICEF, ActionAid, Care and British High Commission. She's also guest faculty at IIM Ahmedabad with the Strategic Leadership Program. We welcome you, Dr. Arvinder. Thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction. Our next speaker, Dr. Varej, did her MBBS and MD from Government College Patiala and then since senior residency from Government Medical College and Hospital and PGI Chandigarh. She worked in the government hospital for about three years before working at Tuvamba Hobay's hospital in Australia for a year. Since 2005, she has been a senior consultant psychiatrist at Fortis Mohali and her areas of interest include adolescent psychiatry and women mental health. She writes regular articles and publishes papers in journals aimed at increasing awareness of psychiatric disorders. Her areas of interest include writing, reading, traveling, and bird watching. We welcome you, Dr. Varej. Thank you so much, Beneath. Uh, as authorities across the world emphasize on the infectious and mutating virus and controlling the further spread, a disconcernable rise of almost 40% has been observed in the mental health disorders. We as the education community have been actually sandwiched between the health risks of reopening schools and emotional and psychological risks if we keep them closed. However, experts from both education and medical fraternity and large section of parents have pushed for the reopening of schools to allow children a sense of normalcy. Besides learning loss, children have been subjected to loss of confidence, mental distress, violence and abuse, and of course reduced development of social skills. The consequences will be seen and felt not only in their academic achievement, but also in the societal engagement. There has been an increased risk of dropout, not returning to school, absenteeism and obesity. And as they say, if stress burnt calories, we all would be supermodels. Today, with two professional renowned speakers, we will explore in depth the tools and techniques to elevate the increased risk of suffering from mental health concerns, not only during, but also post pandemic. What is the role of parents and staff in helping the student community bounce back with resilience in what has become the new normal? Uh, tell me, Dr. Arvinder, uh, the psychological impact on children has been huge. As almost 1.4 billion students, they almost had no access to schools. Children have been deprived of their playground times, learning in classrooms, socializing, and much more. How difficult do you think it's going to be for this generation who has faced the brunt of isolation for almost two years now to deal with the emotional development in their coming years? See, to begin with, uh, the situation is extraordinary. I mean, none of us sitting over here 
had ever imagined we'd see something like this, right? So it's one thing to take a little break, but it's totally another to be forced to be indoors and the sense of threat that one has constantly been exposed to, especially our children. So if you really look at it, the psychological impact has been tremendous in the sense of, you know, for very young children, there's a kind of a sense of loss of what is real and what is not. I'll give you a small example. Uh, my little niece, you know, she was watching uh, something on the television and there was this bird and something and she said, Papa, is this real or is this in the TV? Okay, and this wasn't something that was like a child who's sort of discovering a television. This is a child who's obviously very savvy thanks to the technology and the iPads and the iPhones and the what have you. They're very exposed but not really knowing. Another young nephew of mine uh, uh, actually a friend's uh, nephew who refuses to now walk on the road just picks his feet and says no the coronavirus will get into me. okay so this is an example of the kind of psychological impact it can have on very little children as we come to school in the middle school and the high school years i mean the sense of isolation that actually leads you i mean there's a myriad emotions where do i begin we i you know all of us, in fact, at this moment are on a spectrum on anxiety. Why am I saying students? Everybody's on a spectrum on anxiety at some level or the other. But people, and if we are, since we are talking only about the school population today, I must say that because we have parents and teachers and everybody else also joining us, I mean, everybody's really thinking of what is this? When is this going to end? There's a sense of isolation. There's a sense of loneliness. There's a sense of anger. There's grief. Uh, there's a, a kind of languishing, there's lack of motivation, one could just go on and on. So all these emotions are being experienced by our children as well. And of course, the kind of, you know, uh, learning that happens in person, okay, and in my field, even the work, what happens, the kind of exchange that happens when two people are present, whether there are words or not, it's phenomenal. And something like a virtual medium is by definition, that's what it is. It's virtual. It isn't real, right? So they have to grapple with something like that. They have to come to terms with it. So yes, the impact has been there in terms of all these emotions, in terms of lack of motivation, in terms of, you know, not wanting to know and not wanting to make plans for the future, in terms of a sense of disappointment uh, of not being able to carry on with the plans. We look at the high schoolers, they can't have their farewell parties, something that they've been planning for forever, uh, not having their graduation ceremonies in person. So all of it is, is and not knowing where the career is going, where would they get it? Look at what they went through. Exams are happening, they're not happening, marks are happening, not happening. So there are all of these things happening. But to see, is this impact going to be long lasting? One of the most beautiful things about human beings and their brains, which of course, I know Dr. Varech is a better person to speak about, is the ability to bounce back the resilience. I'm going to touch on the psychological aspect, but I'm sure she'll talk more on the brain aspect because how the new neurological connections do get made. So the ability to bounce back in human beings is also very strong. That's what resilience is all about. Look at what so many of us have gone through. But eventually, I mean, as a as a human race, we've gone through so much. Uh, the floods, the droughts, the, the earthquakes, the other disasters, and we do bounce back. It takes time, we do bounce back. There are some techniques, which I'm sure we'll be talking about later, on what we can use, but the ability to come back is also something that's there. So whereas it's been, uh, it's been quite something psychologically for, for everybody, but look at it, if there was technology, we at least had some way of connecting. I mean, we are talking today, right? So there is some kind of at least some technology that connected us. And also the fact that when we go back, yes, there'll be a transition. Just like the transition from school to home and working from home, the same way working from home and going back into your school, you'll have a whole lot of excitement. You'll also have your fear. You'll also worry about the third wave. You'll also sort of not know how to come back with that. You also have gone into a lull of being at home and you may also be desperate to come out and be back in your normal environment which was taken off. 
it's normal to go through this gamut of emotions and it will all happen to you. But do know each one of us is very resilient. We will bounce back. Thank you, uh, ma'am, for your inputs on that. Uh, Dr. Viraj, if we ha uh, may have your feedback on this, how bad and difficult do you think it's going to be for the children to face these challenges in the coming years? Uh, so like uh, Dr. Vinda has said, you know, children are facing a lot these days. Uh, for them, especially, uh, you know, being at home for two years for younger children, they learn so much through play and, uh, you know, their social interactions, the coping skills, the way they communicate. Uh, there's so many children you see, you know, they've not been going to school for a long time. And when they start going to school, suddenly the vocabulary picks up so much. So, you know, because they need so much of uh, input from various uh, uh, environments and uh, school is a different environment. The home is a different environment. And uh, this has completely uh, like they say, it takes a village to bring up a child. Oh, no. So now the village is also no longer there, the school is no longer there, the neighborhood is not there, and it's just the home. And often with nuclear families, that uh, limits it even more so. So uh, I think it's really had a big impact on children. But yes, I think that there's more and more uh, work going on in this field. There's more and more awareness. A lot of young people are willing to come and take help. In fact, they do tell their parents that, you know, I think I need to go and see someone and talk to someone. And, um, and parents then are also becoming more aware, though at times they still hold back and they say, you know, why do you need to do that? And you can be strong and all those typical statements that we always hear. But, uh, uh, but still, I think uh, with children being so much more aware, I mean, the internet does have its drawbacks. You know, people are getting addicted to the internet. But I remember this one young person who was living with his mother and he used the Internet when his mother started becoming, uh, you know, she started having hallucinations mm -hmm. and he was uh, 13 years old and he actually looked up and he found out and he searched, you know, what can I do? And uh, then he contacted his uncle through that. He contacted uh, the police also through that because he probably saw that, you know, if she's not going to take help, then you can do all these things. And he managed to get her in for uh, treatment. So, I mean, everything has its drawbacks and uh, advantages. And maybe I think we can have conversations in the classroom also about what the children have learned from COVID. It's been a difficult phase, but have they learned something from it? And maybe that is something that will help them to build up more resilience in the future. Of course, we do talk about how it could lead to future depression. You know, people going through grief over the loss of someone, uh, a family member in COVID. So these can predispose to vulnerability to develop depression later on in life. Uh, so we need to be aware of these things. We need to um, be able to talk to children in classrooms at home so that, uh, you know, even if that happens, then early treatment or early management will go a long way to help them. Uh, this also closely reminds of the mixed feedback or, you know, we keep receiving from the students. So when we were actually planning to reopen, there has been a mixed response. There are eager set of children who are who are actually waiting to come back and experience their school life years. And then there is a second lot who have caught into their comfort zones and the confines of their homes with everything at their easy disposal. What is your message to the second lot and also for the parents who are watching, for the kids who haven't returned back and who are getting into their more and more comfort and easy zones? What's what's your message for them? Uh, Dr. Yeah, ma'am, please. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, please let let Dr. No, no, I think uh, you're a better person to answer that. I mean, you're working in a university also, but um, yeah, I think uh, you know some children need a little bit of pushing, and some are more laid back. But sometimes the parents are also genuinely worried, and they they are holding them back. I mean, there are children who want to go back to school, but then the parents say maybe we can wait a little bit longer because of the uncertainty. You know, they're not sure. 
so uh, it may not be only the children sometimes it's the parents also but eventually i think uh, you know they may have their hesitation they may have got used to a uh, more laid back uh, approach to life but once you go back to school you know that's also something you enjoy so dr um, pindar arvinder ma'am so just to recap your question you're asking me what is my message for the students and the parents on going back you know i'm going to say yes exactly what you said that look you're going to have your fears you're going to have your trepidations should i should i not is this okay because i feel that you know the one thing that has happened after pandemic is the way we look at things has changed in the sense of i don't remember you know walking home every time and washing my hands okay now that's such a second nature to me so to some extent some things have changed and what will happen is that like i said you know there is something that really takes us forward and that has been like for example faith and in a country such as ours something that we rely a lot on is faith the faith in whatever you want to put in whether it's i'm not necessarily talking about religiosity or spirituality or something like that but the faith within of bouncing back of being able to carry on and you know our culture has a lot of uh, like stories you know i mean we say things like this too shall pass and you know um darkest before the dawn and stuff like that so we do know and and i think it's going to be a mixed bag a uh, it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling if you're anxious it's okay to feel anxious but it's not okay to stay anxious okay it's okay to have like oh my god you know like i had the anxiety figuring out why is my audio not working on this uh microsoft teams or why is the video not coming i'm sure you guys also have the same issues that's okay but if i just if that anxiety paralyzes me then there's a problem so you all will feel anxious you all will feel excited you all will worry my goodness you know my my child my precious one is going to be in a boarding pack you know so many people how are they going to manage trust that the school will do the best okay and trust that the school is creating if they are taking the responsibility of having your children back they will do something what you can also do is you know integrate your reality into whatever is happening the reality is that when we are working from homes also for example just now you know your doorbell might ring and you might have to answer the door if you are alone integrate that reality into who you are and not push it away and pretend it doesn't exist so if you are anxious do something about it you know seek information ask the school uh, if if parents are listening to me ask the school the right questions that you want to but to live in fear and keep your children in is not going to be helpful i mean dr varaj just told you that how the growth of a child happens when they come in when they play when they come in contact with children their own age etc 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 so you're going to rob your child of that if you operate out of your fears so deal with your fears secondly do realize as human beings we are very resilient there's always a gift in adversity and what gift has come is about you know we learned about our resilience we learned some new things you all are on this new medium something that you had probably never done in your life you know i've never done so much screen work as i'm doing now i'm a very in person you know kind of person right but it's learning it's bouncing the third thing i'd sort of say is make us make build awareness and if you see someone around you who's looking a little sad who's looking a little upset who's not looking themselves do know that the pandemic may have exacerbated many problems that were earlier very manageable in terms of emotional issues depressions uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders and so on and so forth you know they've really gone into multitudes simply because the trigger was there so if you see someone around you like that go and talk to them you know just ask them how are they doing what are they doing also build awareness and remove the bias remove the stigma that we have around seeking help it is okay just like if you have you know if you break your leg you would go to an orthopedic surgeon similarly if you're having trouble with your emotions if you're not able to if you're depressed if getting out of bed is difficult you will go to a psychiatrist you know you will need the help of a psychiatrist and with medication and whatever is the biases that you have oh my goodness i can get addicted to it this can be you know these are all misconceptions and myths talk to someone who can help you bust these myths and you know the good psychiatrist here will tell you how with medication 
the chemical depression can be handled. You know, people with bipolar disorder can lead very normal lives. It's as easy as taking a pill for diabetes or hypertension or a vitamin pill, you know, but if that can help us carry on and by which by no means am I advocating medication only. I'm just saying bust the bias if you have. Not all conditions need that. For the most part, for your stress, if you talk to someone, someone who's qualified, someone who's trained, you will feel better. But if that's not happening and for more than two to three weeks, it's difficult for you to get out of bed, you're not able to concentrate, you're weepy, you're crying, you're sad, go to a psychiatrist. Get yourself some help. And for the most part, the psychiatrist might just say, no, you don't need medication, just go for counseling. Just do that. So trust, faith, build some positive environment around your children, encourage them, and together look for information so that this transition back from home to school becomes a healthy, smooth, uh, for both the, the, the people, both the parties and all the parents as well as the children. You know, this brings me to the next question that uh, I think it would be uh, wrong if I say that we haven't experienced anxiety. I think each one of us, we have experienced anxiety at different levels. And going by the stats, if we see the 17% of the world population who suffers from some or the other level of depression ranging from mild to swear. And there are times when people actually mistake it or, or they're not willing to accept it. And, you know, they normally mistake it for a bout of sadness or it could be a mood swing. Uh, tell us, when when do you think that people should seek professional guidance? When when do, you know, when they, when they realize, when do they need to be prepared that, okay, there's something wrong in me and I do need professional assistance or support? Uh, Dr. Simi, if I can have uh, your uh, feedback on this, please. Uh, I mean, recently, uh, because of uh, COVID, there has been a significant increase in overall anxiety and depression. So uh, the thing is that it's not always clinical anxiety or clinical depression. It may last for a few days. It may settle down. But when it persists and uh, when it becomes, uh, it starts interfering with your daily routine. So then it, it is something to watch out for. So for example, if I'm uh, continuing to feel low, persistently low for day in and day out, and it lasts for at least two weeks or uh, more, and uh, even though I'm pushing myself to go to work every day, but I feel that pressure, I don't feel happy, I feel a lack of motivation, but I'm pushing myself. So that could be the beginning of mild clinical depression. In moderate clinical depression, it will become even more difficult for me to do things. And I may stop, start skipping. I may take a uh, day off from work. And when it becomes severe, then we are not able to do that. Anna? So severe obviously becomes recognizable. It's the mild or moderate where people sometimes keep pushing themselves. Even in clinical anxiety, at times, uh, they are able to hide what they're feeling. They may have a panic attack, they may have uh, social anxiety, but they're able to a lot of times uh, you know, have a calm demeanor and not really show it. So, but still, you know, some just do come. Parents may observe that the, uh, you know, the child has become more irritable or is socially withdrawn or is not talking to anyone. Or there may be changes in sleep or appetite. So those are the times when we can try and talk about these things that, you know, if you think that there is uh, something going on or you need help, that we are there for you. So a lot of times uh, these things can be picked up. But yes, sometimes people just do not express anything. At times, even if uh, someone takes, uh, you know, a step like suicide and at times when you go back in history, sometimes there's nothing there. I mean, the parents may not have noticed any big change also. So, but often there are cries for help and uh, we need to be wary of these. And just like we go to the doctor for, you know, if you get COVID, we do, we'll rush to the doctor. If you get fever, you get a sore throat, you'll go to the doctor. So we need to be aware that mental health is the same as physical health. Your brain is also a part of your body and uh, any changes in 
chemicals, any changes can cause changes in mood and motivation and interest. And so even ideas of hopelessness, suicidal ideas are, are a symptom. And that's why we don't, I mean, have to ignore them and we need to be aware of these things. Dr. Singh, if I may have your thoughts on this. Well, they pretty much summarized that, you know, a very simple way, very beautifully said, Dr. Varaj, where in a simple way, you know, if for more than two weeks, look, we all go through stress on a daily basis or some kind of sadness or anxiety. Right. But, you know, if you find that you're not able to, and this will be when you, when the normal things in the day, you're not able to. You know, like your walk, your dressing up, your, you know, so you know something is off, something is odd. And if it continues, it's, I mean, normally if you hear somebody, some sad news, you will feel bad for a little while or sad for a little while. But if you find that it's been more than two weeks and you're continuing to just feel the same or even deteriorate, then it's time to seek help. So I just want to focus on the fact that if you, if you seek help at, at a timely uh, in a timely manner when it's just stress then it doesn't move into the crisis mode like the severe mode that dr varaj is saying and for the most part mental health issues most of them can be contained at that level except if they have a chemicality to it you know then of course you need that kind of psychiatric help but if it's to do with situational you know with what is happening now the grief the loss of a loved one uh, the kind of dysfunctionality in the family that's bothering you if you don't take care, you don't share your emotions, you don't vent it, it just stays inside you, it is going to choke you. So it is pretty much like a drain. You know, if you don't clean it, it gets choked. So the emotions are also like that. So the emotional drain will get choked if you don't really, you know, cleanse it through some kind of maybe healthy habits that you may be having. It's it's known fact that you're feeling not so great about it, go for a run and you suddenly start feeling better. You know some chemicals have happened in the body, you know there's been some dopamine and some loss of you know, serotonin and so on and so forth. We all are aware of reducing cortisol and the stress hormone and you know, simple things like go for a run, go for a walk, have some kind of self-care, you know, and that most of us, many people, are, you know, especially people who have a lot of responsibilities, on them, maybe mothers who are working as well as looking at home, see self-care as a selfish activity. And I say self-care is actually most required because you can't really serve from an empty vessel. So if you are the apex and you know you really need to do things, take care, take good care of yourself, going for a walk, um, you know, eating healthy food, talking to someone, listening to music, uh, anything and everything, reading a book, watching, I mean, anything that really brings your soul uh, in a space where it's happy is good for you because then the people around you, each one of us is like a magnet. So the people around us also get impacted by our moods. So that's, those are simple things. So if you find someone around you who's upset, low, not looking themselves, you know, talking about death and dying, philosophizing about what's the point of living, do know that they're going through something. A, don't just say, no, that's rubbish. You're not feeling that. Okay. Most people, suicide people normally say, oh, it was sudden. It's never that. People have been contemplating, you know, and the fact is they throw some hints. It's just others around them are either too scared to pick those or don't want to believe that. There's a denial over there. So people, when they start talking about things like what's the point of living or when you find that in adults, you know, maybe the substance abuse has increased or started or you find that the look is disheveled and they're not really interested in it, you know something is happening. The sudden change in behavior, somebody who was very chatty has become very quiet or somebody who's very quiet has become very chatty. They're suddenly sending these goodbye notes. You know something is happening. Talk to them. Don't just think that, don't just assume that talking will plant an idea in their head, but just talk to them and ask them how they are feeling. For the most part, research has shown that people are actually wanting to talk to someone. And they're just waiting for someone to ask that question. So go ahead and do that. And if you find someone around you or you are going through that, do know there's nothing wrong in it, nothing, nothing harmful in it, but go seek help. Uh, you know, we've reopened for senior classes and we've received a fantastic response to that. Uh, and we expect the junior and middle school students to report on campus in about next 10 to 15 days. Uh, what's your message for parents and how can they prepare gradually, uh, you know, 
to tune children to come back to boarding life because they've been away for a long, long time. So what, what can parents do in this time to, you know, uh, prepare students so that they don't have any sort of social anxiety disorder because they've been confined in their homes, surrounded by parents and have all facilities at their disposal. So how can parents actually work with students? Let me tell you, most of the students might just be very happy to come back to their school and to their own environment because, you know, they have built their own little world there, okay? And it's a world where, which is like, you know, initial, like the transitioning. So if somebody's only been there for a few months, they may have a little bit of trouble. And the reason why you have such a fantastic response in the high school years, you know, your, your senior students, is because they are happy to come back to their environment, right? Yeah. They love their parents, okay? Their parents, they love you so much. But they also love the independence, the space, the world that they've ha they have created on, on, on campus, so to say. Okay, so I don't see that as much of an issue. But what I really see is that once they come, you know, they'll be excited and then the excitement will wear off and then they'll start missing home. You know, that's the part that happens. A, create some system of communication. Make sure that you're communicating with your children continuously, right? Not on a, not like a helicopter parenting because that becomes another issue. But like, you know, create a time when you're in touch with them. Also, when your child is really talking to you, missing or crying, don't start crying with your child, even if you feel like, right? Do it after you put the phone down or, you know. But at that point, let them just vent. You don't have to rescue them and say, oh, oh, I'll come and I'll pick you up and I'll bring you home, okay? Nor do you have to say nothing going, you have to just stay there. So you don't have to be on other extremes. All they are looking for is venting. So once you allow them to say whatever they have to, look, they're going to miss the home food, no matter what. You know, the hostel food sucks everywhere, all over the world, not just. And I'm sure Seliqui does a great job of giving them good food. But I'm sure it's like, you know, it, it can't match the home food. So they're going to do like that. They're going to complain to you about food. They're going to say things. You have to just hear them out. Don't give them solutions, my dear parents. They don't, they're not looking for solutions. They're only looking for a venting space. Once they vent, they feel lighter. And once you sort of say, would you like to come back home? They're probably going to say, nah, it's okay. I can manage. It's not so bad. So I think that also happens. And we really need to see that if our children are going in that space, then, you know, we just, we'll let them vent. We let them speak. Okay. And for our own emotions, we prepare ourselves for the children who have flown the nest, okay? Because they are now from here, they're going to move, and you've been used to that. I am sure parents also might not say anything, but for the, for many of them, they might be missing their space as well. Because whereas there was initial excitement when the pandemic happened, we were all together, we were all doing things together, we were cooking together, we were cleaning together, slowly boredom set in. Slowly people were not interested in, in doing that. So I'm sure in a way, let's not assume that there will be there will be social anxiety disorder. You know, maybe there is going to be a lot of, you know, people will surprise you. But if there is a little bit, I wouldn't call it an anxiety disorder. I am pretty sure on that. I would just say, you know, that little bit of teething trouble, as you say, of the transitioning. Transition will always, at any stage in life, bring about a little bit of flutter. You know, whether, you know, a, a, a young student who's going to go out and join the college uh, from college to career from career to marriage from marriage to having children and it goes on and on and on so the every transition in life or people you know when they've worked whatever 40 years of their life and then they're retiring that has its own challenges so every transition will bring some ripples but let's treat them as ripples and not like a tornado so we just need to be calm about it and just not give any yarn. Just, just listen, let them just talk about what they're feeling and say, okay, what can we do that will make you feel a little bit better? Okay, can I send you, okay, can we can we speak? Can, can I send you some goodies? Can you go talk to a friend? Okay, can you go be with the housemaster? Can you, you know, I mean, there are spaces. I know boarding schools are lovely. They have a lot of spaces which are very family-like. So... The school authorities, I'm sure, will do something about that. Like ensure that, you know, every evening you're meeting the students, you're doing some fun with them, you know, just so that, and maybe maybe you'll be a little flexible 
in the kind of routine you had earlier and give them that transition time so together it's a three way partnership the parents the school and the students so if you all work together i'm sure there isn't going to be any major anxiety disorder i mean just remove that word that i don't see that happening uh dr varach your uh, gyan for the parents who are a little apprehensive about sending their children to school or for the children who who are too happy to be addicted to screens at home how do we uh, coax and persuade them to come back to the campus so uh, i don't know if parents have actually told you that you know children are addicted to screens but i guess over here you know it's important from an early age to have some kind of boundaries and rules in the house i mean you have cities like chandigarh and bangalore where people are quite strict about uh, traffic rules and you know so all of us follow those traffic rules <laughs> but the moment we go to another state we become a little lax because we know that okay over here even if you pick up your mobile no one is likely to catch you so you know even as adults we need rules and boundaries and the earlier you have them for children that's really important and internet rules should be discussed before children are allowed uh, access to the internet and uh, uh, similarly if they are not being able to follow the time they have set for themselves then we need to do a discussion again and then see set up some consequences or or maybe have other activities you know the thing is that we also need to be role models so if we also need to have a technology free time we need to sit down together and as a family and do things together so i think that way covid has helped a lot of families to actually bond together because they are our people who have sat down you know they've uh, played games together they've okay watched a movie together and you know like dr arvinder is saying cooked together and <laughs> done so many things so i think it's important to maintain that you know even if covid has been going on for all this time if, if some children have become very dependent on the internet then maybe that is the time to kind of seek help because uh, yes there have been people who have come where uh, children are spending all the time on the internet and uh, even locking themselves in at times missing meal times so uh, the, we need to notice when this starts happening and then to get some intervention for it early because the later it becomes more difficult to to convince them to you know get some help for it so uh, there may be many different reasons you know it's not always that it's just internet addiction sometimes there's underlying depression sometimes there's uh, some other issue that has happened and uh, so we need to address it early but even now i think if it's happening uh um, coming back to school would be the best way to treat it and the next time they are there on a holiday then you know we need to discuss those rules and discuss what kind of uh, activity schedule kids would like to follow even in the holidays you know even in the holidays after two or three days or four five days of resting having a regular physical activity during the you know every day just like we ensure that children eat three meals a day we also need to ensure that they are having some physical activity so i think sometimes as indians we are very preoccupied with what they eat and uh, in fact in other countries you do not find people uh, forcing their children to eat and even teachers do not if if a parent tells a teacher over there that please make my make sure my child eats the teacher will say it's not my business <laughs> you know but yes. in india we expect even in schools parents will go and tell the teachers can make sure my child eats that if <laughs> and the teacher will also make sure because they also <laughs> indian <laughs> parents so we are so obsessed with them eating you know right and we also need to focus on that physical activity and that's going to happen only if we go out for a walk if we don't go out or we don't exercise why will they so maybe the next time in the holidays when the parents will can watch out for for the for these things and you know keep it in mind i think very happily put that of course children will do what they see uh, happening around them not what we would say them to do or what we would ask them to do uh, 
um, what's your message for the students? You know, when when they, uh, you know, they are not able to define that fine line as to when the time spent on screen actually requires intervention. We all know it's become a double-edged sword, and it's like necessary evil. It's become an inherent part of our lives. But when do you think the you know, it becomes an addiction or when do you think an intervention is required? What what are the alarming signs and what's your message for the students? Dr. Ravinder, if I can have your inputs on this first. I, I would definitely add, but I think, you know, uh, Dr. Varej should be answering this. But if you were to ask me, I would just sort of say uh, in life, uh, we have to help ourselves and our children look at things that are urgent and important. There are important but not urgent. So when we have, like she rightly pointed out, if we don't have a structure, if we don't have a discipline, it will become an addiction, right? But a habit is is, and the thing is that it takes um, to change a habit. It takes very very long. So we have to actually go on the preventive side and not in the curative side. So preventing means right from the beginning establishing. For a student, when does it become an addiction for you? My dear friend, if you start justifying, no, I'm not doing so much. Actually, it's not that much. You know what you're doing. Okay? This is the rule of addiction that, you know, when you start justifying, saying not actually, I can leave it two days. I haven't, you know, so whether it's the screen time or, or any kind of substance, when you start saying that, you know that there is a problem there. So don't fool yourself. And as far as the others around are concerned, if you just have a structure, and if there is no time for, uh, you know, for the for no time, very, which is very, very unstructured and for very long, I always sort of say that unstructured time is good. But if there's too much unstructured time and for too long, uh, then you know that, you know, you sort of these kind of things creep in. Like it, what happened during the COVID lockdown, everybody's sleep went for a toss because everybody was, you know, nobody had to work. It was locked down, you could be out of the house, you could not walk, nothing. So what were you doing? Watching Netflix. And it was endless and people were comparing and look at the amount of time you spent. Oh, you slept at two and three, you woke up. Whereas it was okay for those one or two weeks because that's how it would be cooked. But if that just became a way of life, then you should be. So to me, the first sign is when you're justifying. But technically, what are the signs? I think Dr. Varaj is a good person to ask. When do you think this has become addiction? See, uh, addiction, uh, for addiction, basically, it's the same criteria as uh, any other addiction. So these days, we do not use the word addict or, uh, you know, even the term abuse has also been removed. But basically, uh, you know, when you start using something in higher amounts, higher quantities, so, and uh, you, you have withdrawal when you don't have uh, access to that, the, to the internet or to the computer or to your mobile. So I think sometimes, it, you know, it's good to have a technology free time and uh, just set it aside for some time. And if it becomes too much of a debate or it becomes, uh, you know, something that uh, escalates. So those are uh, some of the warning signs. Uh, uh, along with that, you know, neglecting other activities, neglecting other things, not getting up even to take a bath or uh, even, um, you know, sleeping less because you're just spending too much time on internet gaming or spending too much time Netflix binge watching. I mean, we all do it at times, right? but if it's at times, you know, you, you've done it once or twice and then you realize that it's a bit too much and then you're able to stop it and do other things, then it's fine. But if it's in increasing amounts, if you're neglecting other activities, if you have withdrawal symptoms, if you don't have access to it, if you're ending up having problems in relationships with family members because of it. So those could be signs that you may be developing some kind of dependence. And uh, it's, it's wise to take a step back and, you know, start uh, including some other activities uh, during your day and spreading the time also discussing with the family members how much time you would like to spend on it and whether you're being able to stick to that schedule or not if not then okay again discuss it that you know mom I'm, i was trying to do this but i'm not being able to 
uh, again i spent this much 5 hours yesterday so as long as you're having the discussion it's fine but like dr vindar said if you are in denial and you say that no there is no problem i can control it any time so denial is often there when we do have some kind of uh, dependence on something we tend to deny it and we tend to say that no this is not happening i can control it any time i want to i'm just doing it because i have nothing else to do you know or i'll start exercising from next week or and then the next week comes and then it's again i'll start tomorrow so when it becomes constant and i think for parents also you know sometimes they'll say children are rude but what do we do i think from an early age it's very important to learn how to be able to tell children that okay you know the fact that you're speaking to me in this tone indicates that there's something wrong so when you're able to talk to me in a calm voice then we can carry this discussion forward so it's important to check that tone of voice and that rudeness or the irritability again at an early age if we allow them to become rude and we take it uh, that also then can continue or it can escalate at times like this so uh, these could be the signs but not always i mean these could be the signs of depend developing some dependence um uh, we are a boarding school community right where peers are often the immediate and strong social support uh what message do you have for the students what are the signs and symptoms they should be watchful for if they feel that there is any change in the behavior of their dormates of their classmates or or their peers so now when do you think they should report it to uh, the authorities or the people concerned what are the signs they should be uh, you know cautious of any visible change and there is there are times when they may actually need no visible change in the symptoms as we discussed earlier so what what's your message for the students here Doctor, um, I may have uh, your thoughts. Okay, so I would say that uh, a, all of you, all of you, my young students over there who are watching this, do know that each one of you can make a difference in your dormates, your peers, your you know, your friend's life. So any time that you see someone, you know, who is behaving very differently than what they were earlier. somebody who's not eating properly because in the mess if you're together you're seeing that somebody who's missing meals not eating properly having sleep issues do know that they are going through something these are very basics in they are they are maybe i don't know whether there's a possibility of missing class or you know they're not attending in class or something like that you can see if they're looking disheveled you know they're not looking themselves you know if they're looking like they're not taking care of their hygiene you know these are signs that they're going through some emotional stress or distress and if another thing i want to tell you is that you can give a most beautiful gift to another human being by just listening to their story and not tattling on them so if somebody shares with you something that has happened in their life you know maybe it's a break up with a girlfriend boyfriend maybe it's it's a family issue that you know something is happening maybe there is somebody ill in the family maybe you're not able to focus on your academics maybe there is so much but if somebody shares with you please contain it don't judge them and say oh no 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 rubbish you can't feel like that oh no 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 you're not feeling like a suicidal but rather see what is happening talk to them and then depending on the severity if somebody is talking about killing themselves and if any friend of yours says promise me this is a you know you're not going to tell anyone but i'm planning to kill myself or commit suicide do not promise any such thing that's a thing that should be escalated immediately i mean your school has systems i don't know what their systems are is it the house master is it you know so escalate to an adult who can take care of this you know do you have an infirmary do you have a house master do you have, like how do you do that so you should have also in the school everywhere you know there should be some important numbers that are displayed you know where somebody can call up or somebody can reach out depending on what your school systems are i am not very familiar so you can i'm sure extrapolate and see and all of you do know sometimes you will feel panicky you will feel so panicky and that panic attack or anxiety attack will feel like a heart attack to you 
like your mouth is dry, you can't speak, you're paralyzed, you're really, you know, and you're hyperventilating, you can't breathe properly, you know you may be panicking. If somebody is going through that, you know, just, just be around, just offer them a sip of water, just, you know, check with them. And many times, you know, this kind of a panic attack situation passes off in a bit. But if you're there, if you start panicking with someone who's panicking, then it's going to get worse. And if you can't handle, then call someone who can handle. But not crowd around, not sort of make a deal of it, but also see that how we can help each other. You know, for the most part, mental health problems can be dealt with if we are sensitive, if we are good listeners, if we are aware, if we don't judge, and if we don't say, oh my God, you know, how loosely we use words like mad, crazy, etc., etc. Pagal ho gaya hai. If we refrain from that, and if we really, you know, anytime anyone says, oh, I have a cleanliness, OCD, I said, for goodness sakes, don't use the word OCD. You have no idea what that is. And you know, you have no idea how debilitating that is. Yeah, you may be having a fetish cleanliness that's very different than a disorder. So don't use these words loosely. But also see that, also, you know, focus around, if you are looking out for your peers, focus around some kind of sharing and positive, you know, uh, sharing in terms of tips on well-being. What do you do when you're stressed out? So, you know, in little groups, have little conversations around that because sometimes people don't know. And if, if a bunch of 10 kids is sharing, what do they do? So if any one of you is a house captain or something, why don't you call your house and talk about how do you deal with stress? Don't give a lecture. There are plenty of parents and teachers to do that. But you all can just share. What, what do you do? How do you help each other when, when, you know? So if it's stress, what do you do? I just did a workshop with some students and we talked about, you know, what? And there were myriad things from journaling to going for a run to, you know, so on and so forth. So talk about it and acknowledge that it's very natural to feel that. You have no idea. Just validating how much, how good that feels. So as peers, you know, you all can do such a lot. I mean, the next level intervention comes later. At the first level, you all can do it. And don't hide it. Just don't hide it. Tell them, I'm going to get you the best help. Don't tell another student and say, do you know this is happening? But just do the right way. And you can actually, you can make a difference in a lot of people's lives. And if, can you imagine the sense of satisfaction if you've been able to help even one batchmate of yours? I mean, it will stay with you forever. So go ahead and be that compassionate person. Don't think that you only need a specialist for that. Don't think you need a therapist always for that or you need a psychiatrist for that. At the first level intervention, you can do it. So go ahead and help people. Uh, Dr. Pradesh, your suggestions for the students? Yeah. No, very well uh, put by Dr. Arvinda. Uh, see, the thing is, even in Punjab, the government started this program called the Buddy Program. That was basically for uh, drug abuse. Uh, they started this big program for substance prevention. They've uh, started a whole lot of de-addiction centers all over Punjab. It's been quite huge and it's all basically done by one person who had the intelligence and foresight to do this because otherwise this would have taken years. So under this buddy program in government schools, what they're doing is they are educating or talking to students about how, uh, you know, four to five of you can be buddies. So they're just tell them that you know you you're one buddy group and you're one buddy group and basically then they educate them that uh, what are the signs to watch out for and the signs are uh, can be very similar you know because even in substance uh, uh, use when if someone becomes dependent on it or even in um, depression or early psychosis or uh, mood disorders or anxiety disorders at times, people can have change in behavior from um, what they were before. So sometimes students, and especially in a boarding school, you know each other so well. And uh, because you spend, you know, so much time together. And so you are the family and you are uh, a big family and you have, you know, you can be there for each other. And to pick up these signs, uh, uh, and maybe if you're not sure, maybe talking to another a school counselor or a teacher about it. We all have teachers in school that we 
can talk to you know because those are the teachers who do not end up giving lectures they are the ones who are there just to listen and uh, who will say that okay you know okay so how do you feel about that and what made you do that and what do you think you could do next time or what do you think someone else would do in this situation so they're not there to tell you that don't do this don't do that which is something that many many parents also typically tend to do you know ye nahi theek hota wo nahi theek hota aise nahi karte waise nahi karte so rather than that having an environment where uh you know you can just talk about these things like she said you know what 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 do you think you could have done instead or uh and also knowing the things what to say to a person and what not to say not so saying. often we tell people that you know be strong or exercise and you'll be okay and uh you know it it it's just your will power so uh, those are actually things that we say you know not to say and to tell a person that i'm there for you any time you need to talk if you feel uncomfortable talking you can write it down and give me a note or uh, uh, you know just let me know and i'm there for you and um, we can uh, work something out or we can find a solution so i mean being there for a person uh, you always know you know who are the people you can turn to because in a boarding school you like get to know these things you know so you have the people you know you can turn to they'll always be someone so remember that that there's always someone you can talk to and uh, uh, it all of you can be you know ambassadors for mental health because it's really something that is very important a lot of people are talking about it now and it's going to grow in the future and i mean there's nothing like i tell so many people i said i've got you know i used to go, go, go talk to my seniors when i was doing my md and i've sent my son also to a psychologist because obviously you can't uh, talk to them yourself it's better to send to someone else or so many relatives and there's nothing uh, you know at, at times uh you need to go to a psychologist first but at times you need to go to a psychiatrist because if you so it depends and um, being able to identify that is something that uh, i think more and more people are being able to do now uh one last stakeholder i think it would be unfair if i miss out on them uh my colleagues and teachers of course the educators community mm -hmm. so who face the challenges at large because of pa pandemic one nugget of wisdom for our gurus on how they should stay calm while they face the turbulence underneath i would just say in one phrase please take very good care of yourself because you know your self care is most important like i said you can't serve from an empty vessel so make sure you're taking very good care of yourself have some i mean you know we cannot ever talk enough about enough sleep good food exercise some routine something that makes your heart sing and if any one of you are going through something take care of that that i include that whole thing in self care your well being is absolutely primary because you are the parent of the children over here not just your own kids at home but the children here and and you have to hold them so take very good care of yourself and thank you for being there for our children because if it weren't for all these lovely teachers you know what would our children be so thank you for being who you are for taking care of our children please do take very good care of yourself uh dr vinesh your uh, gyan for the gurus please <laughs> no i think uh, you know that's the most important thing like dr arvind said that first of all you have to take care of yourself right no it's like even a mother who is expecting a baby has to look after herself first because if her physical health her mental health is good you know then the baby will also most likely be healthy but if the mother is uh, you know feeling depressed if the mother is stressed out is irritable or the environment in the house is not good and uh, other people are not helping her or 
is leading to problems then it it even stress anxiety depression during pregnancy also affects the child so just like we try and provide an optimal environment there here for the teachers and parents also they need to first look after themselves and their own health including their physical health their mental health take out time for yourself you know like if you're caring for someone you need to take out some time for yourself do a fair favorite activity or do your regular exercise and have your mantras you know sometimes i feel mantras really help you i mean on a day when you're really down talking to yourself and telling yourself that relax take it easy or i can think about this tomorrow or each day is a new day right. and nothing is the end of the world and they help you to get to uh, you know that day and sometimes the next day you wake up feeling far better so yeah that's all i'd like to say on this and the teachers definitely in a boarding school you know they are on double duty because <laughs> they really don't get any time off and uh, so they need to keep in mind all these things thank you very much for sharing uh, your your expertise and your nuggets of wisdom which i'm sure will keep everyone sane and smiling uh, may i now request our senior master pastoral mr loynet to propose vote of thanks He has a technical glitch, I think. So perhaps uh, I'll extend thanks on his behalf and everyone's behalf from the school fraternity. Uh, the important takeaway is that we must validate our emotions and seek assistance and support uh, whenever required, and we must stay uh, hydrated well to boost our mood. And of course, we must try to distract and honor ourselves. Uh, you know, diverting our attention and pampering ourselves in whatever way. we enjoy the most but thank you very very much for sparing time from your what is i know is very very busy schedules thank you dr singh and thank you dr varaj for joining us today thank you very much thanks for having us over thank you all the best thank you very much paneet thank you, thank thank you. you. <laughs>